everyone. Uh, welcome. I think we can see the number stabilizing. Thank you very much uh, for joining us at today's Balliol online lecture. Uh, I'm Richard Norman. Uh, I'm a fellow of the college and I run the development office, which, amongst other things, organizes these lectures. Um, and just before I introduce today's lecturer, who's, who's beside me, I, I just wanted to note briefly that it's three years, of course, this week that Oxford and the UK went into lockdown um, in the foothills of the COVID-19 pandemic and, and all of the effects of that on so many lives. Um, just a few weeks later, we hosted the first in this series of online lectures. Um, I think it was very clear to us that we, we would have to do alumni relations in quite a different way for, for a significant period of time. Um, and today's the 27th in that series. And I wanted to thank you very much for joining us, um, whether it's the first time you've joined us or, or like many names I can see uh, on this screen, then um, you've been with us for most, if not all of them. Um, it's been very important to us um, to find this new way of bringing uh, Balliol closer to you uh, and also to bring you closer to the academic work that goes on in the college today. So, um, so thank you very much for that. Um, and as with every Balliol on my lecture, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. So the Q&A box um, that should be at the bottom of your screen probably um, is available. You can upvote and downvote questions if you if you wish. Um, and once the lecture finishes, I will rejoin um, and help put those questions to our lecturer, who is um, Dr. Fred Smith, uh, who's beside me. Um, Fred is an early career fellow in early modern history at Balliol. Uh, he joined us in Michaelmas term 2021 from Clare College, Cambridge, where I think you completed everything from your graduate studies and the JRF at the same college, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And um, so Fred's post um, as an ECF um, has been created as part of that um, early career fellows scheme, which offers three or four year academic appointments to researchers in that really crucial phase between their doctoral studies or in some cases a junior research fellowship and a, and a longer term academic appointment. Um, it benefits students hugely because they get this succession of fantastic uh, young researchers uh, who are involved in their teaching, of course, including Fred. Um, and it wouldn't have been possible without the generosity of many donors to Balliol, including quite a few people on this course. So thank you very much for, for that too. Um, as we'll hear today, Fred's work has been on the history of Catholicism and Protestantism in the religious upheavals of the 16th and 17th century in Europe. Um, and that was the subject of his first book, which was called Transnational Catholicism in Tudor England, published last year by OUP. Um, and he's in the process, while he's with Balliol, of expanding that that approach towards religious radicalism more generally in the early modern period. Um, and I suspect we'll see some of the intellectual foundations of that work in today's lecture too, um, which is entitled uh, Burning Questions, Reassessing Bloody Mary. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Fred. Thank you very much. Yeah, and um, thank you very much for all, all for coming. So it's really nice to see um, so many of you here. And um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. And there we go. Um, yeah, so um, as um, Richard was saying, this is this is a, a, a lecture which sort of comes out of my research that I did for my book. I uh, didn't include it in the book, uh, but what I've been doing since, um, and uh, since uh, we've moved out of lockdown, it's become a lot easier to do this sort of research because we'll see it's quite, um, it, it involves a lot of going to different places abroad. So um, hopefully you will enjoy the uh, fruits of the, uh, the, the research. Um, and so this comes a bit from teaching Balliol undergraduates because I teach a lot of Reformation history um, and students tend to have a really good knowledge of things like Henry VIII. But when it comes to Mary I, they really only seem to, to, to know really two salient facts about Mary I when they first come, come to me. And that's um, one, that she attempted unsuccessfully to restore um, uh, England to the Catholic faith following Henry VIII's break with Rome. And two, that in doing so, she burnt um, a lot of Protestants. Um, and this is really hardly surprising that this is the image they have, given the image of Mary that's presented in all sorts of public exhibitions, in uh, historical dramas, and in popular histories. From, for example, the London Dungeons 2010 exhibition entitled Bloody Mary Killer Queen, which had this terrifying image and was actually banned because it was scaring children, um, to a 2021 Edinburgh Fringe show entitled Bloody Mary Live, which reimagines Mary as a Gen Z teenager. Um, this popular image of Mary is, really has been wholly preoccupied with her brutal program of religious persecution. 
Now, that this should be so really is no accident. I mean, the, the image of Mary as a, a bloodthirsty persecutor was put forward almost immediately following her death by the Elizabethan Protestant regime. And especially in the work of this man, uh, John Fox. First published in 1563, John Fox's Acts and Monuments, um, better known to people as his uh, Book of Martyrs, uh, set out a series of vivid depictions and descriptions of Protestants um, uh, murdered by the Marian regime. And the text which accompanies this image, which is taken from Fox's Book of Martyrs, um, is kind of is, is typical of Fox's prose in general. So it recalls how one of these women who was burnt in Guernsey in 1556, um, who, who was pregnant, gave birth at the stake only for the child to be thrown back into the flames by the, the crowd. And it reads, and so the infant baptized in his own blood to fill up the number of God's innocent saints was both born and died a martyr, leaving behind to the world um, which it never saw, a spectacle wherein the whole world may see the Herodian cruelty of this graceless generation of Catholic tormentors, a perpetuum brae in Parmium. So it, it's easier to see, therefore, how Fox's text, a text which incidentally has been continuously in print since 1563, helped furnish the evidence with which this popular image of Bloody Mary was subsequently forged. However, Fox's narr narrative has also really set the mood music for much of the historical scholarship on Mary the First Reign. Indeed, one of the most... Uh, the, the most significant and influential 20, 20th century in, interpretations of Tudor England, which was put forward by A.D. Dickens um, in his landmark book, The English Reformation, published in 1964, echoes Fox in portraying uh, Mary and her Archbishop of Canterbury, Cardinal Reginald Poole, as individuals lacking both in the common sense and the creativity needed to restore Catholicism in England. The Catholic reaction over which they presided, Dickens argued, was marked by an exceptional religious and cultural sterility, uh, something which he said was apparent not only in their brutal and ineffective attempt to suppress Protestantism, but also in their apparent unwillingness to use new uh, technologies such as the printing press in order to return the English people to the Catholic fold. And in a damning conclusion, Dickens said that uh, Mary's reign represented not only an unmitigated failure, but a failure which was likely to have become more monumental with every succeeding year. Now, this interpretation of Mary's reign does still have some adherence today amongst historians. Um, although willing to concede some successes to Mary and her church, David Lodes, one of the foremost historians of Mary's reign, insisted in 2011 that it isn't safe to argue that if Mary had lived another 20 years, England would have enjoyed, enjoyed a comfortable and safe Catholic future. Nevertheless, over the past 30 years, there has been a growing number of scholars attempting to paint a more positive picture of Mary's reign. Instead of working backwards from the assumption that England was preordained to be Protestant and that Mary's Catholic re restoration was therefore predestined to fail, they've instead emphasized um, the need to approach Mary's reign on its own terms. And in doing so, they've discovered a religious program which was far more dynamic, strong, and in some regards successful than hitherto acknowledged. For example, some have drawn attention to the evidence that suggests that Mary knew how to persuade as well as to persecute. For example, using the pulpit very effectively to encourage those um, who've gone over to Protestantism to return to the Catholic faith. Meanwhile, others have highlighted the fact that Mary and Archbishop Paul implemented a series of really remarkably forward-looking religious reforms, um, especially in terms of um, improving the poor educational and moral standards of the English clergy, something which was a key Protestant bugbear. Although Mary's untimely death only five years on the, on the throne meant that she never had the time to bring these reforms to fruition, there's nothing to suggest that in time they wouldn't have been successful. Mary herself has also been reassessed. Uh, once dismissed by Geoffrey Elton, the famous Tudor historian, as rather stupid, historians now recognise a very driven and determined queen who navigated the difficulties of being the first woman to inherit the English throne with no small amount of skill. However, the fly in the ointment for all these positive uh, interpretations of Mary and her reign 
remains her decision to burn alive almost 300 Protestants. Even those historians who are most eager to emphasize the positive aspects of Mary's reign have conceded that the burnings were not only morally abhorrent, but also a tactical misstep. Rather than persuading English Protestants to recant and return to the Catholic fold, most agree that the brutal executions had the opposite effect, provoking popular sympathy and galvanizing the resolve of Protestants, whose willingness to face the flames um, rather than recant, was held up by their fellow co-religionists as proof that theirs was the true church. In this respect, therefore, the burnings were ultimately counterproductive, emboldening rather than emaciating English Protestantism. Only one historian really has dissented from this opinion, and that's the Regis Professor of Divinity at Cambridge, Eamon Duffy. Now, Duffy's argued that sympathy or support to the Protestant victims of the Marian persecutions was geographically limited to just a few communities. And he argued that there was no sign of spreading religious disaffection in Maryland, England as a result of the burning. But most controversially of all, Duffy suggested that the burnings were beginning to achieve their aims at the end of Mary's reign. A, a conclusion that rests on his observation that the number of Protestants burned fell dramatically uh, during the year 1558. And he argued that this tailing off of the, um, the um, the burnings at the end of Mary's reign was not because the popular of popular opposition or because the government was losing faith um, in its um, strategy, but rather because there were fewer defiant activists to execute. In his words, the Protestant, the Protestant Hydra was being decapitated. The burnings, in other words, were an effective solution to the problem of restoring Catholicism to English soil. Now, Duffy's arguments have proven extremely controversial. Uh, not only have historians balked at the suggestion that violence could ever affect uh, a genuine religious conversion, but many have voiced concerns that Duffy stretched the evidence a bit further than it would go. And Duffy himself admitted just last year that it remains to be seen how much of my uncomfortable line of argument about the effectiveness of the burnings will ultimately find a place in perceptions of Queen Mary's and Archbishop Poole's attempted counter-reformation. So what I want to do today is to reopen this question of whether Mary's persecution of Protestants can be considered to be effective and, by the standards of its time, sensible and legitimate. In other, another way of thinking about it is, had Mary not died in 1558, would her policy towards Protestantism have led to Catholicism's continued success in England and to the demise of Protestantism in England? Now, these counterfactual questions are, of course, they're impossible to prove one way or the other. But I believe we can get to close to an answer, or at least closer to an answer, by considering a thus far really neglected perspective. And that's by looking at what contemporary European Catholics at the time thought of Mary's efforts to deal with her Protestant problem. Now, this perspective has been largely and strangely absent from the historiography on the Burnings, with most very much focused squarely on English responses and rooted in English sources. When foreign attitudes have been discussed, it's usually been to suggest that the burnings, in the words of Andrew Pettigree, um, would have seemed decidedly old fashioned as well as brutal to European observers, i.e. that other European countries had started to doubt the efficacy of persecuting religious dissenters and were instead beginning to advocate some form of religious toleration as the best way of dealing with religious pluralism. However, as I hope to demonstrate today, a sustained look at foreign reactions to Mary's campaign um, against heresy, it produces actually a very different conclusion. And I think that this foreign perspective is, is important and can provide a really uniquely useful way of gauging the effectiveness of the Marian persecutions for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, there, there is a real danger when approaching a question like this of failing to forget the future. Um, of assuming that because England ultimately remained Protestant, Mary's policies were always predestined to fail. Um, a foreign Catholic perspective of the, at the same time allows us to avoid this danger. It provides us with an assessment of Mary's persecution, which is uncolored by the knowledge that Protestantism would go on to triumph on English soil. Second, there's good reason to listen seriously to what these foreign observers have to say about the Burmans. As the first nation which had returned to Catholicism after falling to Protestant, uh, the Protestant faith, foreign Catholics had a real vested interest in coming to frank and honest assessment 
as to whether uh, Mary's approach to dealing with Protestantism was a success or a failure, as it could help in their own battles against Protestantism elsewhere. Their perceptions are therefore worthy of our attention. And finally, and most importantly, examining these foreign perspectives allows us to move beyond these fairly simple questions of how effective the burnings were and start to engage with the more interesting and, and larger question of what their actual significance was. By exploring what Catholics in Spain and Italy and France thought about the Marian strategy for dealing with Protestantism, I hope to demonstrate some of the ways in which the religious histories of England and Europe became intertwined in this period. Okay, so how was the Marian persecutions against heresy viewed through European eyes? Well, the first type of source to consider in this context are the reports of foreign ambassadors and agents who were resident in Marian England. Now, there's always a reason to take sources with a pinch of salt, and these are no different. Um, foreign ambassadors had their own particular agendas, which could color their readings of what was going on in England. And it's also true that many foreign ambassadors got their evidence for things that happened outside of London from um, second hand, from, from their own agents elsewhere. So they didn't have first hand experience outside of London. Nevertheless, it still remains striking that a wide variety of foreign ambassadors and agents from different countries with different agendas all put forward remarkably similar interpretations of the burnings. Indeed, for the first two years after the start of the burnings in January 1555, French, Italian, and Spanish ambassadors all spoke with more or less one voice in suggesting that the executions were succeeding in only in confirming Protestants in their beliefs. In a series of reports sent back to Italy over 1555 and 1556, for example, the Venetian ambassador Giovanni Michele repeatedly encountered, uh, recounted the constancy of Protestants in the face of the flames. For example, in uh, relation to a burning in Essex in April 1555, he explained how the victim most vehemently exhorted the multitude to persevere in their religion and endure as they themselves did any persecution or any torment, something which so moved the people that the governor of the town was apprehensive of an attack on himself and his officials and of their being maltreated, very strong language having been used against those who ordered the execution. This same impression was shared by a Mantuan agent, Aluizio, um, Aluizio Schivenolia, who wrote home from London in uh, May 1556, having witnessed the burnings of an old man of 70 who hobbled to the place of execution on his crutches, willingly, angrily, and pertinaciously declaring himself a blind young man whose spirit and perverse, um, was perverse and obstinate, and two elderly and, young, and two younger women who went happily to their deaths without shackles or any other constraints, as if they were going off to be married. French visitors spoke in a remarkably similar way. Following a visit to London in which he had observed the burning in February 1555 of a, a notable Protestant, uh, the protonotary of the French king explained how the victim's constancy had brought such pleasure to the onlooking crowd that it seemed to be more like a wedding than an execution. The following month, Simon Renard, the ambassador to the Spanish Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, echoed this impression that the executions had hardened many hearts, for it has been seen how constant or rather stubborn these heretics prove at the stake. As well as emboldening the Protestants, these ambassadors also noted the fear that the burnings might provoke popular revolt. For example, the French ambassador Antoine de Noy noted in May 1556 that through her use of fire and the sword, Mary kills so many people against which all her people make a great protest. Meanwhile, the Venetian ambassador Michele reported in June 1555 that the Marian bishops were intent on executing the sentences against the heretics. And two days ago, to the displeasure, as usual, of the population um, here, two Londoners were burned alive. Such sudden severity, he concluded, is odious to many people. A year later, following the execution of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, he warned of the possibility of great commotion, as demonstrated daily by the way in which the preachers are treated and by the contemptuous demonstrations made in the churches. Spanish observers too were equally clear that the, the, the burnings risked uh, provoking revolt 
in a series of reports to the Spanish king, um, Philip II married um, the first new husband. Simon Renard reported that the people of this town of London are murmuring about the cruel enforcement of the recent acts of parliament on heresy, which has now begun. The following month, he expressed his opinion to Charles V that the English bishops are so hot and hasty about religion, causing herons heretics to be burned every day, that I fear their rashness may cause the people to rise in arms this spring. Foreign ambassadors and agents, agents were therefore more or less united in their fear that initially the executions were both emboldening Protestants and provoking public opposition. However, as time wore on, several seem to have begun to change their minds. Indeed, it's worth stressing that Renard's objections to the burnings in 1555 were founded more on the grounds that the timing was wrong rather than the strategy itself. As he explained to Philip in February 1555, your majesty might inform the bishops that there are other means of chastising the obstinate at this early stage, such as secret executions, banishment, and imprisonment. Similarly, for Giovanni Michele, writing a few months later, it was the sudden severity, the subita severita, which in his mind was odious to the people. In contrast, by the final years of Mary's reign, several foreign ambassadors and agents seem to have come to the conclusion that on the whole, the program of prosecution was actually succeeding, at least in pacifying the Protestant threat, even if it wasn't succeeding in convert converting the hearts and minds of the most committed Protestants. For example, despite initially being fairly downbeat about the success of Mary's efforts upon his first arrival in England, Annibale um, Lepolfi, who was the Mantuan ambassador to Philip II, reported in April 1557 that the queen, who had been using as much strictness as she can, was making some good progress in securing conformity with Catholic practice. As he explained, the queen puts a lot of effort into it, and this is there in the judgment of all, there was much greater devotion in both confession and communion. He was even more hopeful about the progress that was being made in Canterbury, where he reported Archbishop Paul has worked miracles, succeeding even in having converted certain very stubborn old heretics. And as a result, Letolfi was hopeful that more fruits might yet come from the Marian approach. A more balanced, but overall still largely um, positive interpretation was offered by uh, Giovanni Michele, the Venetian ambassador, in a long report that he sent home in May 1557. Like Le Porti, he was sure that many in England remained committed to Protestantism. As he said, in the interiors of their souls, they are more ulcerated than ever. Nevertheless, despite his earlier fears that the burnings might be emboldening Protestants, he now insisted that the overwhelming majority of these people dare not show their heretical beliefs for the fear they have of losing, losing both life and estate. As a result, he said they were dutifully conforming, frequenting churches, partaking in all the ancient Catholic rites and ceremonies, and for all intents and purposes, appearing Catholic. In other words, the persecutions, despite doing little to win over the hearts and minds of Protestants, were succeeding in scaring them into outward conformity. Another of Philip II's most prominent diplomats um, seems to have uh, concurred with this. Writing to Philip in uh, November 1558, uh, Gomez Suarez de Fuguero argued that it was explaining to uh, Philip II his uh, fears about the future of Catholicism in England as Mary I lay dying. He worried because Elizabeth, as he said, was not well disposed in that matters of religion and he was inclined to govern through men who are believed to be heretics. However, although he had pessimistic impressions about the future, he nonetheless implied that Mary's actions up to that point had succeeded in forcing Protestantism into hiding. He suggested that there is not a heretic or a traitor in all the kingdom who has not joyfully raised himself from the grave in order to come to Elizabeth's side. Now, this might be a rhetorical flourish, and I might be interpreting taking too much from it, but to me, that phrase, raised himself from the grave, seems to imply that the ambassador considered Protestantism to be something, to be somewhat dormant at that point, ready to spring back into life, definitely at the new Queen's accession, but currently in a somewhat zombified state. Overall, therefore, 
These reports from foreign ambassadors and agents suggest an, albeit heavily qualified, endorsement of the Marian anti-heresy strategy. They were virtually unanimous in their belief that the executions were not persuading those English people infected with heresy to recant. And initially, they were worried that the burnings might provoke popular unrest. Nevertheless, as the campaign wore on, they seemed to have come to the opinion that the burnings were succeeding in driving Protestantism underground, scaring the people into outward conformity. Although perhaps not the most ringing of endorsements, this would probably have been counted as a success by the Marian church. After all, the elimination of the most publicly recalcitrant dissenters meant that um, the restoration of Catholicism could continue without open defiance. It might therefore have given the Marian regime the space it needed to concentrate on converting the hearts of Protestants, um, of, uh, certainly of the less openly defiant Protestants by other means, it gave them breathing room. Turning from these ambassadors reports now to the opinions of those Catholic observers who looked on from abroad, Perceptions of Mary's efforts to restore Catholicism in her kingdom become far more unambiguously positive. Indeed, Andrew Pettigrew's suggestion that the Marian burnings would have seemed anachronistic to contemporary Catholic observers is certainly not borne out by an exploration of the orations which accompanied the various funeral services which marked Mary's death across Europe. Of course, we have to remember with funerary orations that they're hardly likely to give a, a, a balanced approach and appraisal of the Marian regime's policies. They are, by definition, encomiastic. Nevertheless, it is notable that these orations, uh, these orations all foregrounded Mary's success in restoring Catholicism in her, reign, in her realm, including her efforts against heretics. For example, in Habsburg-controlled uh, Naples, a renowned preacher against Protestantism, Francesco uh, Visdomini, preached a sermon in February 1559 in which he portrayed Mary as a providential saviour of England. When miserable England was entirely excommunicated during the reigns of Henry and Edward, he explained, in one lone Mary was preserved all the faith and nerve of the Catholic Church. She was subsequently raised to the throne with a heavenly mandate to save the realm from the clutches of heresy. Above all, above all care, above all importance, she attended to divine worship and Catholic religion, opened churches, purged temples, restored altars, accused and did not excuse the grave faults of her people. When she appeared, Visdomenia concluded, fortune changed its face, so that whoever had fled followed, and whoever had won lost, and whoever had been stubborn yielded. A similar impression was given by the sermon delivered in Brussels, in December 1558, and published the following year by the Bishop of Arras, Francois Richardot. Richardot praised at length the zeal, the passion, the toils, the courage, the constancy with which this virtuous princess always displayed, so as to ensure that the name of God shone throughout her kingdom, so that his holy commandments were kept, so that the fear of judgments remained, so that the meaning of his true word was soundly understood so that faith, piety, religion, and all the concerns, the honour of his holy house was faithfully observed. This seal had, he went on, given her the strength to put, fight, to put to flight the gangs and forerunners of the Antichrist that wanted to encroach on her kingdom. Now, given the religious situation um, in the Spanish-held Netherlands where this um, sermon was being delivered, where there was a series of strict anti-heresy laws which were enacted, but they were very rarely put into action um, due to the unwillingness of local officials just to enforce them. Richard Doe may well have hoped that by publishing this sermon, he was encouraging others to emulate Mary's devotion in purifying the realm from heresy. And indeed, he suggested that much in his sermon. He made the point he was recalling it a few of her great and heroic virtues, not so much to illustrate the memory of her name as to present us another real example that may be imitated. Now, it's worth pointing out here that this impression of Mary's reign um, and her regime's effectiveness in dealing with heresy was echoed, albeit very much inadvertently, by European Protestants. This demonization of Mary and her burnings in literature produced by Protestants throughout Europe um, betrays a real sense of unease that the Marian campaign was succeeding in extinguishing the true faith in England. 
and a fear that similar tactics might be adopted elsewhere. And this is really the impression that we get from this uh, graphic German woodcut, which is printed in Nuremberg in 1555 and entitled Relations from the Church in England, um, where it, it shows this picture of a, a, a sort of a, the Romish wolf uh, in, English, and in the form of an English bishop, really sort of cutting the throats of the Protestant martyrs. And rather than focusing on the constancy of those martyrs in the face of death, which we might expect from a woodcut like this, a, a Protestant woodcut, this instead drew a rather more pessimistic lesson and explained how for eight years the divine word has shone in England in every place, i.e. the Protestant word, but that ingratitude was the reason for which it is now being extinguished. And it ended with a sharp, stark warning to the German people to always be thankful for God's word in order that similar persecutions might be, avoid, um, might be avoided in German lands. A similar can, example can be found in this text, um, which was printed on a Protestant press in Leipzig in 1555. Now, this is a Latin translation of the Marian Bishop of London's articles for an Episcopal visitation of his diocese. An Episcopal visitation is essentially where the bishop um, sends out various uh, agents to go and make sure that what's happening in each of the individual parishes is going the right way. Um, now, these articles, which had originally been published in 1554 by the Bishop of London, had set out a series of really probing questions to ask to various church wardens um, into the practical markers of Catholic orthodoxy to make sure that there were no Protestants among them. And it led to the arrest and ultimately the burning of several uh, Protestants. Now, this Latin translation reproduced these questions, but along the side, it added a very a series of marginal glosses which were pointing out the iniquity of these, these, these questions and, and indicating where there was lots of religious error creeping in. And it also appeared under this new satirical title. And the title read, A New Inquisition of Heretical Depravity in the Kingdom of England, translated into Latin so that the pious people will know how salutary it is and how greatly it is to be desired to erect similar inquisitions in other kingdoms. Now, although the suggestion that Mary's inquisition might inspire similarly brutal persecutions elsewhere was clearly intended to scare Protestant readers into greater zeal and greater vigilance, there is no reason to um, believe that this fear itself wasn't real. Indeed, this translation really seems to attest to foreign Protestant awareness of the terrifying efficiency with which the Marian regime leveraged mechanisms such as Episcopal visitations in order to weasel out Protestant heresy in, its, in the realm. And that's an idea which we'll turn later, this idea that people might have been, it, might have been aware that the English regime was really um, being particularly effective in finding Protestant heretics. So far then, we've seen that on the whole, foreign ob observers both during and after Mary's death, don't seem to share what many historians have had of this pessimistic assessment of the burning. On the contrary, Mary's record as a vigorous, uncompromising, and on the whole, effective scourge of heretics seems to have garnered a considerable degree of respect in the minds of European Catholics, not to mention fear in the minds of Protestants. However, it remains, remains to be seen whether anyone put their policy was where their mouth was. In other words, did this Marian approach to heresy actually influence the approach taken by other European Catholics in the years following her death? And to explore this question, I want to focus on a single case study, um, and that's late 1550s France. Um, so a bit of context is required here. Um, so France at this time, officially a Catholic country, but had a large number and a growing number of Protestants um, within it. And this was despite the fact that in France there existed some very draconian anti-heresy laws, um, or at least anti-heresy edicts issued by the king. So the reason that, the, that they were having such a problem with Protestants in, in France and that they, these edicts were not being, um, were not effectively arresting and executing heretics is due to the nature of the, uh, the persecutory system in France. So unlike England, where those guilty of heresy 
would be automatically sentenced to death. French courts had the power to arbitrate punishments according to the merits of individual cases. So this meant that over the mid 1550s, when France's premier law courts, the Parlement de Paris, um, became increasingly dominated by those who were sympathetic to certain Protestant ideas, it meant that many of those who got accused of heresy and came up in front of the court um, were given extremely mild punishments. So they essentially let go rather than being um, rather than being executed, which by according to the edicts existed, that's what they should be doing. Now, this was all very much to the chagrin of the French king, Henri II, and he was desperately um, wanted to deal far more harshly with Protestants in France. After securing a peace treaty with Spain and England in April 1559, he finally had his opportunity to devote his attention fully to the pursuit of heresy. And accordingly, on the 2nd of June, he signed the so-called Edict of Ethuan. And this took aim at those magistrates who had proven unwilling to enforce the existing anti-heresy legislation. The edict underlined the link between heresy and sedition, and it stressed that every effort now needed to be made to identify and prosecute uh, Protestants, especially those who were associated with, associated with John Calvin's Geneva. And it proposed to dispatch special commissioners into each province in order to facilitate the, uh, the expulsion, punishment, and correction of the said heretic. These commissioners were to be aided, it, the, the edict stipulated, by judges who were to show the utmost diligence in identifying and capturing heretics, and who were no longer to demonstrate any leniency at all towards those found guilty. All convicted Protestants were to be put to death in order to serve as an example of others. Now, this edict was followed several days later by an unprecedented royal intervention in the Parlement de Paris itself, where Henri, um, wary that several of the judges there favoured Protestantism, marched in and arrested eight of the speakers. Now, Henri II died on the 10th of July, but his crusade against heresy was continued during the reign of his teenage son, Francois II, um, under whom the government was effectively in the control of this man, Charles de Guise, uh, the Cardinal of Lorraine. Now, under Lorraine's effective regency, a series of further declarations and laws aimed at persecuting Protestants were issued over the course of 1559. Now, these included edicts ordering rounding up Protestant ministers, demolishing Protestant meeting houses, and demanding that lord landlords inform on their tenants, with penalties including execution or forfeiture for those who refused. Although these edicts were only partially enforced outside of Paris because they could have, there was no mechanism for enforcing them otherwise, um, they nonetheless succeeded in creating a real atmosphere of sphere in the French capital in 1559. And it led to the, the, a far more, a far larger number of uh, French Protestants being executed in that year. So both Henri II and the Cardinal of Lorraine therefore seem to have agreed that a more intensive and vigorously enforced program of persecution was the way to deal with the Protestant threat in France in 1559. And in that belief, there's reason to believe they might have taken inspiration from Marian England. We know that Henri II had been keeping an eye on the progress of Mary I's campaign from a very early stage. A report from the Imperial ambassador to France in April 1556 explained how, having discussed the difficulties he was having with the spread of Protestantism in his reign, uh, in his realm, the French king had brought up the heresies in England and the good work the queen had done in that connection. Now, this admiration later seems to have developed into something much more like imitation. And this much is suggested by an intriguing letter sent by the Cardinal of Lorraine to his sister, Mary de Guise, who was Queen Regent of Scotland, because uh, so effectively the Guise family were in control at this time, basically very much in France, um, but also in Scotland, where, um, as we say, Mary de Guise was the Queen Regent. And this was a letter sent on the 2nd of June, 1559. Now Guise at that time was attempting to suppress a Protestant rebellion, which had begun in Perth three weeks earlier and precipitated the, um, the conversion really of Scotland to Protestantism. So in this letter, Lorraine offered uh, counsel for dealing with, in his words, the wicked Lutheran 
He suggested that if God allowed her to overcome the Protestant rebels, they needed to be punished and their main leaders executed. In that suggestion, he was echoing instructions he'd sent earlier that year, rebuking, rebuking Mary for her gentle um, bearing towards heresy. But what is important for us, however, is that in making this um, a suggestion to Mary de Guise, imploring her to be more um, to be more brutal in her suppression of heresy, he suggested that she take inspiration from Mary in England. It's necessary, he explained, to do as the late Queen of England did. Unfortunately, Lorraine didn't elaborate much further on this to exactly what he meant, exactly what he was saying she should uh, copy about Mary in England. But it seems clear enough that he thought Mary the first example of dealing firmly and unequivocally with heretical leaders should serve as a guide for her namesake in Scotland. However, as well as guiding their views on heresy in Scotland, there's reason to believe that both Lorraine and the French king may have seen Mary's reign as inspiration for their own religious policy in France. In this same letter, in which he suggested that the Scottish Queen Regent should do as Mary I had done, Lorraine suggested that here in France, we are in extreme trouble on account of similar Protestant intransigence. He explained that he and the king were working continuously to implement a similar solution to that which he was proposing to his sister, i.e. a solution which would see the Protestants well chastised. Now, this is no doubt a reference to the Edict of Equon, which we discussed earlier, which was issued on exactly the same day as this letter was sent. So could it be therefore that Henri II and Lorraine were all, um, also have the example of Mary in England in their minds when they launched their new offensive against heresy in June 1559? Well, this is a question I'm still looking through and I'm going to the archives in Paris next week, hopefully, providing everything's working, um, to do a little bit more digging on this question. But, there is further evidence that French policy in this period was taking its cues from Mary in England. And that comes in a letter sent by the English ambassador in Paris, Nicholas Frockmorton, um, sent to Elizabeth I a few months later in September 1559. Now, Frockmorton reported that the Cardinal of Lorraine had recently set out strict and very extreme injunctions for dealing with the Protestants. These injunctions had, uh, Frockmorton explains, taken the pattern as I do understand of the Cardinal Paul and the Bishop of London, his injunctions set out by them in Queen Mary's time. Now, Frockmorton didn't explain which injunctions he was referring to here, but there are certainly some striking parallels between the French anti-heresy measures issued in the autumn and winter of 1559 and those which have been issued by people like the Bishop of London and Cardinal Paul in Marian, England. For example, um, the new um, measures introduced under Lorraine um, echoed one key aspect of the English, um, English campaign against heresy, which was its use of informers. Now, Mary, many Marian bishops and justices of the peace had made use, made use of lay informers who had been secretly instructed to help detect heresy amongst their neighbours. And in a similar way, on the 8th of September 1559, the Parlement de Paris ordered landlords to spy on their tenants, explaining that they would be held responsible if found uh, guilty of concealing them. There were also financial incentives for informing, since the informant could gain some of the confiscated goods of the convicted heretic. Um, and again, here's, there's some similarities here with the situation in England, in which the uh, revived heresy laws of 1555 explain that private individuals could profit from the forfeiture of lands for heresy. However, the most significant um, uh, parallel between the English and the French examples of um, driving against anti-heresy um, was the fact that the new measures that were implemented by the Parlement de Paris in this period shifted the focus of the French anti-heresy campaign. No longer would it only be looking for those who actually engaged with Protestant ideas and practices, but it would also now start looking into those who failed to just um, fail to, to demonstrate the markers of Catholic orthodoxy. So it's no longer you had to be an active heretic, but if you were passively not engaging, that was enough. And in this regard, French policy may well have been influenced or informed by the Bishop of London's 1554 injunctions for his London visitation, the ones that we saw printed on the, that German press earlier on, 
or for any other um, injunctions issued in um, Mary in England. For example, Archbishop Poole's uh, injunctions for Canterbury in 1557, and they both of which had meticulous checklists of orthodox behaviour that people needed to use. So if Morton's report is to be believed, it seems that the Cardinal of Lorraine thought that the Marian approach to heresy was not just effective, but worthy of emulation. Now that's significant, especially when we consider that the Cardinal of Lorraine was not a hawkish zealot. In, on the contrary, he seems to have been someone who was actually predisposed against the use of force in dealing with heresy. He was a moderate reformer by inclination, and he was someone who seems to have believed that heresy was really better fought on the spiritual front rather than physically. However, his overriding approach to religious policy seems to have been pragmatic. He, um, his approach to heresy varied, being more moderate or more vigorous, um, in accordance with what he believed was more likely to help in the maintenance of social and political order. If, therefore, he chose to endorse the vigorous and uncompromising Marian strategy for dealing with heresy in 1559, he did so because he believed it was the most expedient solution to the Protestant threat at that time, rather than through an overabundance of zeal. So it was a considered and um, thought, um, well, a well thought through um, decision on his part. So taken together then, the evidence presented here, I think, suggests that in the immediate aftermath of Mary's death, the English Queen's campaign against heresy was viewed as both sensible and effective by a prominent European cardinal eager to find a workable solution to the Protestant problem in his own territories. Now, this is just one example. Um, however, there are many others I haven't got time to talk about here. For example, in Milan, for example, we have um, Archbishop Carlo Borromeo, um, who effectively headhunted former Mary, members of Mary the First Church in the early 1560s to help um, in the reform of his own diocese in Milan. But part of the problem he was having in Milan was the growth of heresy. And through the influence of these uh, former members of the Marian Church, he consciously copied um, the model of Episcopal visitations which Mary had used. For example, the one um, we saw with Reginald Paul, but also the one we saw with the Bishop of London. Um, so he used the same framework um, again, which in order to, at least in part, to find heretics in his lands. Meanwhile, in Spain, um, an, an, one, another historian um, at Oxford, uh, Jonathan Edwards has um, similarly highlighted the way in which Philip II of Spain may have been inspired, um, at least in part, by the Marian example in the changes he made to the Spanish Inquisition in 1559. For example, he um, uh, Edwards has suggested that in the fact that in October 1559, um, Philip gave a public oath in which he expressed really unquestioning support of the Inquisition that that might have been inspired, inspired by the Marian example, where the repression of Protestantism was very much driven and championed by the monarchy. Overall, therefore, the evidence presented here would seem to endorse Eamon Duffy's controversial thesis regarding the burnings. In the eyes of Catholic Europe, at least, Mary's campaign against heresy was effective and it was successful. To them, the Queen's modern moniker, Bloody Mary, would not have been a mark of shame, but a badge of honor, a recognition of her effectiveness in dealing with the Protestant threat in her realm. Furthermore, rather than, rather than appearing anachronistic and old fashioned to these foreign observers, as most historians have suggested, the Marian persecutions seem to have played an active role in shaping some European strategies for dealing with Protestant heresy. In France, in Italy, and in Spain, Mary's approach to Protestantism was held up as a model to be emulated an example of persecution done right. Now, questions, of course, do still remain. As it became clearer that England was destined to remain Protestant over the reigns of Elizabeth I and over the early Stuarts, did European Catholics start to reevaluate their appraisal of Mary's effectiveness for dealing with heresy? Now, that's an issue which I'm eager to explore further and I'm still looking into. However, regardless of how the, the memory of the Marian persecutions evolved, Recognizing the extent to which European Catholics shaped their approaches uh, to Protestant heresy in dialogue with what happened in Mary and England is significant. And it's significant not just for understanding of Mary's reign, 
but also for the history of 16th and 17th century England and Europe more broadly. The idea that the English Reformation was somehow its own thing, isolated and largely irrelevant to contemporary events on the continent, is a common one amongst, um, well, certainly amongst a popular audience, but also until very, very recently amongst um, academics. For example, the Oxford historian Christopher Hague once argued that whatever the religious convulsions in 16th and century, uh, 17th century England had in common with the reformations on the continent, they were emphatically not the same thing. And indeed, it still, it, it still remains common to find accounts of the English Reformation, which make little or no re reference to events beyond the English Channel. An idea which it should be shared, said is kind of reinforced by the Oxford history undergraduate curriculum, which still artificially separates early modern British and early modern European history into separate overview papers. However, as this lecture has demonstrated, to divide the religious history of 16th century England and Europe into separate spheres is really to underestimate the extent to which their histories were intertwined and codependent, to which events in England shaped events abroad and vice versa. Now, at the time when much of the rhetoric unleashed by Brexit is encouraging a nostalgic view of Mary's, uh, of Britain's past, as a pioneer that for much of its history, and especially following Henry VIII's break with Rome, went its own way, separate from the rest of England, um, and the rest of Europe, sorry, and this is an example of an um, article in the Telegraph in the 2019. As we're seeing much more of this appear, it seems more important than ever to me to recognise and underline the reciprocities between English and European history. No nation, it seems, is ever truly an island. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Fred, for that very thought-provoking uh, lecture. Now, um, question and answer is available at the bottom, so I'm just going to briefly whet your appetite for future lectures while you get your your questions into the uh, into into that particular box. Um, uh, next. Uh, month, we have Professor Martin Burton, who is going to lecture on evidence-based health outcomes just before he leaves us to take up the post of Master of Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge. Um, and I think that we'll probably end up putting the link to that registration in the in the chat box for you to follow if you want to um, follow that. In May, we'll be having Laurie Balfour, who is um, going to deliver the Omar Asfar lecture on social justice. She'll be talking about Tony Morrison and the legacies of slavery. And then um, in June, we'll have Ling Lin, who is um, uh, one of Fred's fellow early career fellows in mathematics, uh, in his case, um, who I think is going to talk to us about um, the history of string theory and how it's developed over recent years. So a huge variety of, of um, lectures to, to are coming up. Um, and we really hope that um, you'll be able to join us for some of those. Um, I can see there's already a question in the chat, so I'll just turn to that one. And I, I wonder, maybe Fred, if I can if I can pick up that comparative theme in the second of those questions and, and think about whether um, you know how, to what extent your your reading of the archives um, correlates with maybe recusant views um, post Elizabethan accession. And in that period, I mean, I'm thinking particularly of the fact that it took barely or thirty years to decide to get its royal charter from Elizabeth um, after her accession, and presumably there was a period of uncertainty um, at that point too. And are, 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 there, are, are there many things that support the thesis there? Yeah, and so, um, yeah, I, the reason I haven't focused, I didn't focus that much on the uh, English Catholic uh, recusant views of Mary is because that is something that historians have looked at um, before. And there is a kind of an interesting trajectory there whereby they do start by defending her to an extent. So for the first 30, 30 odd years of Elizabeth's reign, you do start, you do see some um, defences of Mary, although for the most part, they don't really talk about the persecutions head on. That's not something that they tend to want to think about. Um, it, they talk about Mary in more general terms, defending her memory as a, as a, um, as a, as a reformer, um, as somebody who, you know, they, they talk about her in, Quite, quite standard bland language rather than specific. What tends to happen a bit later on is you start to get some of the Jesuits, particularly um, Robert Pearsons, who writes a very, um, it's a very provocative uh, piece, which is predicting what should happen if England ever does get the opportunity to return to the Catholic faith. 
So it's basically a, 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 set, a, a, a blueprint for what I should do if um, Catholics get into power again, how they should go about returning Catholicism to, to uh, returning England to Catholicism after these years of Protestant rulership. And what it says is actually Mary probably didn't do the right thing. And that actually at the beginning of the reign, at least what we need to do is show a bit of gentleness to Protestants. We need to give them time to come adjust and time to, to move over um, to Catholicism. So in that sense, you're getting a kind of um, a step away from the, uh, the, the policies of Mary I. And you also see that in other um, discussions about what England should do if they ever come back to um, if Catholicism ever comes back to England. So you get lots of Catholics talking with the Spanish monarchs um, because Spain seems to be the most probable example um, of, of a power that might force England to go back to Catholicism. Hence, you know, in the, the context of the Spanish Armada, getting lots of these conversations coming. And some of those conversations are very much along the lines of, look, if we get back to it, we can't do, we can't make the same mistakes twice. And actually we did make a mistake. Um, and I think the reason, again, for that trajectory of changing is because as England, as time goes on, it becomes clearer and clearer how strong Protestantism actually is in England and how it isn't going to be something that um, sweeps back into England. Uh, Catholicism isn't going to be something that sweeps back naturally into England. There's not going to be this great Protestant, uh, uh, this great Catholic upsurge because rectizancy actually, although it grows, it doesn't. There, you know, there's a there's a rebellion in 1569, but that's not all that serious a threat to the Elizabethan regime. Other than that, you don't really get very many large scale uh, Catholic attempts. You get a few assassination attempts, but those tend to be very small, organised by a small group of people who are trying to take matters into their own hands rather than a coordinated movement. So it it becomes clearer and clearer that what Mary had done had not really got rid of Protestantism, but actually it was still there. So I think over time that changes and I expect you to see the same in the foreign appraisals as well. And this is something I'm looking into. Do we start to get, as time goes on, do people start changing their minds? And I think that there is an interesting um, arena to look at in terms of how, um, as you begin to get certain dialogues about uh, toleration, in this period about toleration being the best way of dealing with religious pluralism. They start to emerge from the 1560s onwards, really. Um, how much is Mary's reign figuring into those discussions about toleration being the best, i.e. are they saying, look, look at what happened in Mary's England. Clearly it didn't work because it's still Protestant now. Therefore, that's one of the reasons why we should be doing something more like toleration rather than persecution. Yeah, very interesting. And picking up on the points that you've, you've just made there about the, particularly about the Spanish, um, uh, uh, reactions and, and, and influences. Um, Rupert Holderness um, has asked a question about um, the extent to which the fact that obviously Mary was married to um, uh, uh, Philip II might have um, influenced, you know, views both ways um, mm -hmm. on some of those questions. Um, is there is there much in the in, in, in the documentary evidence about that? Yeah, I mean, they have Philip and Mary have this very complex relationship, which for a long time historians have thought have been characterized by being something very cold that Philip actually was not particularly keen on marrying Mary, but he did for political reasons. And that, and that's to, to an extent that's to the extent that's held up by the fact that actually after he married, he spent, I think it was about a year in England, and then he was gone for another three years and kind of so he wasn't actually with Mary for all that Good long. Presence. Um, Mary's, but Mary's approach to heresy certainly does take inspiration from Spanish, um, uh, the Spanish example. For example, um, alongside Philip II, when he first comes to England, you get a lot of uh, Spanish clerics who also come along. Um, and those clerics are intimately involved in the, uh, in the, um, the, the, the running of the campaign against heresy in England. Um, and Elizabeth Evidence done some good work on this, um, which looks at the, the extent to which they were involved. Um, and so certainly, yes, there, there is an influence that way. Yeah, well, thank you. And, and actually, the um, uh, Shauna Lanigan asks a, a question, which I think you touched on in the lecture, but maybe you could say a bit more on, um, just to maybe elucidate for, for, for those who don't know the period as well as you do, uh, quite to the extent to which 
burning as a punishment was actually an anachronism in that period or the extent to which um you know was mary really the person who brought it back into fashion as it were it was terrible to say that but. uh yeah so um yeah a really good question basically so everybody at this period virtually everybody almost every person who writes in this period agrees that heresy is something that is justified to execute people for um and it was believed to be a charitable thing to execute them because actually heretics were seen as something as a, a, a sort of contaminant that would um endanger the souls of all the people within your realm so it was a it was a mercy to execute that person rather in order to protect the rest of the community because it was seen as you were protecting their soul from eternal damnation so it, in that sense there's, there's this augustinian model of persecution of heresy which is very much dominant at this time even those people who argue for some form of toleration toleration inverted columnists aren't using toleration in the same way as we think of today as i.e to tolerate people is a virtuous thing they don't think that tolerating protestantism is something which is good intrinsically because it is nice they think it is something which might be the only way of doing a solution so it, it tolerate uh, toleration is more like forbearance of persecution in this uh, this case it's about finding a way in which these people can live alongside in their perspective true believers um rather than something which is uh, a good thing necessarily so in that sense burnings are quite common throughout europe and you get lots of burnings of different groups so, for example, the Anabaptists um, are mercilessly persecuted throughout Europe, and there are there are examples of very intense persecutions of Anabaptists. Um, the uh, people have done comparisons between Mary in England and other places, and it does look as if Mary in England is uniquely intense in the number it persecutes and executes, because Mary's on the reign for only five years. So, if you do the numbers of how many you're burning per year, it's higher than lots of other countries. For example, France which does burn, is burning Protestants at this period, but doesn't burn them in anywhere like the same intensity every year. Um, and that's where people have started, that's where this argument that actually Mary's reign was seen as anachronistic at the time has come from. And actually people at the time were saying, oh, look, this is an, an uniquely um, bad. Um, but as, I, as I'm finding is, the, the arguments, that argument doesn't stack up when you actually look at what they're saying, which seems to be the opposite. It's actually, they're, they're saying, actually, this is a good thing. We should be doing more of this. Um, but yeah, so in, in general, persecution as a burning as a punishment is seen as something that is good, but it's something that in other countries doesn't always result in um, it actually happening because of various structural reasons or because people who are involved in persecuting heresy aren't as are unwilling to send people to the stake to burn, which is kind of, I think, understandable on a human level as to why people might be unwilling to be the person who does it, even if they believe theoretically that it's the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah very interesting. And then pick, uh, taking a slight uh, liberty with Crispin Rogers' question, um, given that you've touched on part of it, but asking it from the other direction, um, are, are, are we sure that maybe looking at um, this question from a sort of efficiency and effectiveness perspective is maybe perhaps quite a modern managerial mm -hmm. bureaucratic take on something and that perhaps we should just dismiss the effectiveness and just think about religious zeal as the as the reason that um that this kind of approach to heresy and sedition comes back yeah no a great a great question um i'm just going to read it again sorry yeah he asked whether emulation is really focused uh, founded in zeal um as opposed to anything about the effectiveness of it well, uh, yes, and I agree there is a degree of that, but so, and that's what I was thinking about an example of the Cardinal Loren, for example. Um, but actually, when you look at him as a person, he isn't a person who is inspired particularly by religious zeal. He's very much a politique, politician more than a, he's a cardinal, but that doesn't really mean in this period you're any necessarily particularly that holy. Um, it's, he he isn't a man driven necessarily by zeal. He is a man more driven by really wanting to stay in power and to keep his family, the Guise family, in power in various different um, in various different um, forms. So he he isn't someone who acts out of uh, you know sort of pure religious zeal. He is someone I think that doesn't react in that way. And that's what made me think that actually his decision to do this is, is based more on a, a considered judgment rather than a zealous one. 
That said, I do agree that there is certainly in some of these cases, you wonder how much of it is, um, how much of it is just sort of an ideological thing rather than uh, how effective it was. But then again, when you look in some of the other places, for example, the Carlo Borromeo in Milan, what he's doing is actually looking at the mechanics of the Marian pros prosecutions against heresy and saying, look, OK, the mechanics of how they found heretics using Episcopal visitations and using this form of um, this, this kind of checklist of things to ask people about in order to say, see if they are a heretic or not. That's what he's emulate. He's, he's emulating. So it's more than just a kind of like, oh, that's an intense persecution. I'll do that here. It's more of a, OK, that's an intense persecution which resulted in lots of people being found and burned. How did they get to that stage and looking at the mechanics of it? So I think it's more, I think there's more thought in it than just a pure zealous um, emulation. But I agree, it, is, it must factor in at the same time. Oh, thank you. Yeah, very interesting. And then turning to a question from Tim Boardman, um, he asks, um, you know, picking up the point you made about the response of onlookers at the very start of your lecture, um, how much evidence do we have about the general balance or weight of opinion amongst the population on the Marian um, persecutions? Um, were there regional variations, for example, as, as, as there were under sort of pre-schism um, Henry VIII period? Yeah. I mean, the problem with this is evidence that we have. So the vast majority of our evidence for the persecutions comes from John Fox, his Book of Martyrs, which talks about individual um, burning episodes throughout England. Um, but it's, there's certainly the intensity of the persecution is very regional. And that very much depends on how, um, how well, it depends on who was the the bishops or the justice of the peace in a particular area and the, the disposition of those people. Um, that depend, that really depends on how intense the persecution was. So for example, um, the, intent, the persecution in Essex was much more intense than the persecution in somewhere like Cornwall. Um, so it, the persecutions in that sense are different. And so we might expect that you'd get different gauges of how onlookers thought about it, depending on how often this happened. If it's happening every week, then it's gonna be a very different reaction to someone happening once a month or once a year. Um, in terms of what we know about the onlookers, again, that is where we don't really know all that much about other than what John Fox says. And it's very difficult to rely on him because he is uh, evidently a partisan person. He wants to show that everyone hated what was going on. So that's what he talks about in his face. Not to say he invented the sources necessarily, but he's unlikely to talk about burnings where they passed off quietly and nobody said anything. Um, but reading between the lines of his, lots of times he talks about how huge numbers of onlookers um, came to see burnings. That doesn't necessarily mean that people are sympathetic. That At this time, the burning of a person, I mean, in, in, any, in any period, the burning of a person alive is a, is a gruesome spectacle, but at a time when it wasn't something that was considered necessarily morally abhorrent and actually if you were Catholic might be seen as something that is a you know a, a, as I talked about earlier a charitable hatred is the word that often gets used in this period that is something which people might well turn up to as a spectator sport as horrid as it sounds so it the, the idea that lots of people went to these things doesn't necessarily mean they were sympathetic um but yeah the problem we really have about Mary's reign is that almost all of our source material is refracted through John Fox's Acts of Monuments, which is a huge, huge multi-volume thing, um, and which was, uh, which Elizabeth ordered to be presented um, a copy to be in every single parish church of the country. Um, it never actually happened because it was prohibitively expensive, but a lot, it, it, it shows how important that text was and how much it has um, influenced the way we think about Mary's reign. As, has, as is the fact that it, it, like I say, it's been in print since 1563. It's never not been in print as a text. Yeah. And then following up, Mark Little's asked a question, which um, I think maybe falls back to the evidence as well. Um, have you compared Mary's approach um, with those adopted under the successful Counter-Reformation um, activities in Italy, France and Spain? You know, is, is there enough evidence available to, to do that, um, uh, you know, as, as background or extension to, to the work that you're you're currently doing um yes so um in terms of how um it compares with those other places the problem the, one of the problems is the um the 
legal framework under which heresy is persecuted in various different countries is very different. Um, so mm -hmm. in Italy, you have an inquisition. So the inquisition is driven, and in Spain, but the inquisition is an ecclesiastical, um, it, it's driven by, it's, an, it's separate from the secular power, it's an ecclesiastical driven by the Pope. Um, you don't have an inquisition officially in England because it is not, it's not organized and directed by the papacy. It is organized and directed really by the secular um, authorities, but in collaboration with the ecclesiastical authorities in England. So it's quite a messy situation and it's different in all the different countries. So in France, again, you do have some inquisitions, but they're almost totally ineffective. Um, but the, um, the but as well as that, you also have this secular um, approach to heresy, which is being driven, and you get different combinations of it in different countries. So it's quite it. In some ways, it's quite hard to draw direct comparisons and say what's what's happening here versus what's happening there. Um, yeah, I've forgotten what the question was. Sorry, <laughs> but yeah. So you, but you do certainly get examples um, you, you, there there is a lot of overlap between what happens in these different counter-reformations in England and certainly in Italy um, and I've looked in other ways into the ways in which for example Carlo Borromeo in Milan is copying aspects of Marian policy and you see him taking verbatim passages from some of the reform program put forward by Reginald Paul in England um, uh, there's a set of things he he publishes in 1556, which is a set of articles basically saying, look, we need to reform this, we need to reform that. And it's sometimes very, very small things. It's about the nature of the service. It's about where, for example, the consecrated host should be kept in a stone tab tabernacle rather than in a hanging pyx that hangs from the ceiling. But there's things like that, which you see him consciously copying and saying, OK, look, look what they did there. We're going to I'm, I'm basically I'm nicking that and doing it here. Um, so there is a lot of concrete um, parallels between what's going on in England and elsewhere, not just in terms of persecution. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then just um, flipping back to the, the religious, um, uh, sort of the, the fundamentals of the religious aspect, and Ben Cosin asks, um, essentially, are, are we being too simplistic by calling it Protestantism and Catholicism? You know, um, mm -hmm. would, it, would it not be, uh, is there a value in thinking more about at least four traditions, Lutheranism, uh, Anglicanism, you know, Calvinism, uh, you know, in, in this kind of period. Um, and does that, would that have, um, would treating it that way have a, a, an effect on your analysis? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, okay, so in terms of Anglicanism, that's not really something we can talk about yet, about because yet, Anglicans, yeah. Anglicanism isn't really a word, a word that gets used until... <clears throat> the seven, late 17th century, really, and is really a product of many of the changes that happen under Elizabeth's reign. So Anglicanism is a bit anachronistic for this period. Protestantism is a word which gets used by contemporaries by Edward VI reign and Mary's first reign. That's how they would refer to themselves as, as um, Protestants. Um, they wouldn't, they, they took inspiration from Calvin to an extent Thanks, yes, but they were not necessarily Calvinists in every every respect. Um, Catholics definitely would call themselves Catholics. Um, but I think the key thing to think about here is that actually it's right to say that, and it's a, it's a great question in that sense, but it is a fluid situation. We, we uh, Historians tend to talk about Catholics and Protestants in this period because it, it is a way of making it intelligible to talk about. But the key thing to remember is actually that religious identities in this period are fluid what it meant to be Catholic and what it meant to be Protestant are things which are being sorted out at this time what we're talking. So for example, what it meant to be Catholic is being defined by, there's this Council of Trent, which um, runs for a long period from the 1540s into the 1560s in various different fits and starts, um, which ultimately comes up with a Catholic creed, i.e. this is what it means to be Catholic. This is still being worked through and actually lots of the people at this time are not don't know exactly what that they're arguing over what that that should be for example archbishop reginald paul himself does spend, uh, is a member does attend the council of trent before he comes back to england and he makes a lot of suggestions about what catholicism should be which ultimately don't get accepted some of his ideas are, are quite close to what luther argues in terms of things about justification by faith um 
And so in, in, in that respect, what Catholicism is, is not solidified yet. It's been being in the process of being solidified, but it is not there yet. Um, Protestantism equally is even more disciperous. It is, um, there is no, there is no, there is no one what it means to be Protestant um, in this period. English Protestantism does have a, a has have a um, sort of common identity in some respect. It has certain key features that it believes in, but even that is not um, is not completely solidified in this period. And actually, again, John Fox's book is kind of skewing in here because he John Fox tries to make it seem as if all the Protestants are united in one common belief, whereas actually they are not, and there are lots of other radical groups in this period and in England, um, who he tries to kind of sweep under rug because he makes it seem as if Protestants don't agree on things, which he doesn't want. So yeah, there, there are, it is more complicated than Catholics versus, versus Protestants, but it is, it's just an easier way of talking about it when you go to, um, yeah. Uh, uh, example about this. And then um, two questions, but one, one going back to your, um, to close, one going back to the, the European relations, um, is there evidence of English ambassadors reporting back to Mary about the way the continent was handling um, similar cases? Is, is there that other flow of information? Uh, maybe I'll just leave that one there for now. Please. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, definitely. Um, there are lots. So there's this continual um, back and forth of um, what's going on from ambassadors, and you're getting lots of reports sent in, usually to the Privy Council rather than to Mary herself. Um, but yeah, and, and they are talking about heresy in different places. Um, I haven't done as systematic a look at that recently as I should have though. So it's actually something I should look into more is actually how the extent to which she's thinking about and, and aware of what is going on elsewhere. But certainly they, they, provoke, they provide these huge, long, long um, uh, letters which go on for pages and pages and pages where they talk about all sorts of aspects of things that are happening elsewhere um, all over the continent. Um, and, and yeah, so that they do, yes, but I haven't looked at as many of them as I should. Um, I'm, uh, Crispin Rogers has just declared an influence by, uh, uh, sorry, interest, I should say, by saying he's the 12 times great grandson of the first Protestant martyr, John Rogers. Um, oh, who wow, okay, yes. Westfield. Um, says he recognises the wedding reference from the French ambassador, he thinks. Mm -hmm. Um, and the question is, um, was it a um, was it a mixed picture in England when Mary came to the throne, um, given that Rogers bemoaned the slow progress of reform and the tendency to superstition? In terms of oh, in terms of what whether the uh, how pro Protestant um, England was, yeah, yes, yes, it is a mixed picture, um, and historians have argued about this ad infinitum. I think most his. Uh, historians would agree, yes, that actually the vast majority of people. So there's a very famous historian, Patrick Collinson, who says that um, it's basically kind of midway through Elizabeth's reign. He says that the insomniac historian has to stop counting uh, Catholics and start counting Protestants to go to sleep. So the idea that there's a sea change in Elizabeth's reign where we move from a majority being some sort of Catholic to the majority being some sort of Protestant. That doesn't mean they're all necessarily being Protestants in the way that Martin Luther would like or that John Calvin would like, but they are identifying as Protestant in some way. Um, and so that's quite a long way after the beginning of Mary's reign, 1553, where actually the majority of people still probably are some sort of Catholic. That said, Protestantism has made some real inroads under Edward VI, where you get a very in many ways, a very radical Protestant reformation. You get the purging of churches for, of um, pictures, they're whitewashed. You get the um, destroying of stone altars, replacing with a communion table. You're getting some very, very um, big changes, not into the theology, but to the material culture of religion in England in that period, which does, I think, start to have a really big impact on people, um, on, on people's beliefs. So it is definitely a mixed picture in that respect. It is, it's, there is, a, the Catholics are probably in the, in, still in the majority, but the Protestants are a very vocal minority who have recently been in power for a, a, an extended period of time. So they are, the, so in that sense, yes, they are very much, um, they are a significant minority. Um, even though they are a minority, they are very much significant and they are very vocal. 
Yeah, thank you. Okay, and then one last question, I think, before we wrap up, um, uh, back to Rupert Holderness again, who asks, how far did memory, accurate or otherwise, of the Marian period influence reactions to the uh, to James II's agenda after the Glorious Revolution? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And actually, there's there's an article by um, a historian called Thomas Freeman who has uh, who's written on this in particular. Um, and yes, it does. And actually, he argues that really that the I think he says that the the actual term Bloody Mary is first used in the context of the um, exclusion uh, crisis, which tries to um, bar James II from becoming king um, because he's Catholic. Um, and he so he argues actually that the, the term that that term Bloody Mary really that's the that's the origins of that term as you see it's, it's based on the idea of Fox and on anti-Catholicism anti-Catholicism is nothing new but it does become particularly intense and particularly politically important during that exclusion crisis and so yes it does um, become very much important in that period that is one of the periods in which you really see an acceleration of the the myth of Bloody Mary being forged in, the, in very much the same way as we kind of still see it today, although um, today it's now seen as something more to entertain children with rather than something that's this really important to politics, but it remains, that that's when it began in some way. Yes. Origin in 17th century Hydra on there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I think that's a, a really good note to end on. Um, Fred, thank you so much for that really illuminating lecture and a uh, very interesting discussion of uh, questions. Thanks to everybody who uh, was with us uh, to listen and for lots of really interesting questions. I'm sorry we didn't quite get to them all, but um, uh, thank you very much. And um, do, do remember the link uh, here to sign up to the next online lecture on the 25th of April uh, on um, evidence-based healthcare. So a uh, bit of a gear shift. Thanks very much. Bye now. Great. Thank you.